Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Amy Vaughn, and I am the owner and chief empowerment officer of Together Digital, a collaborative and diverse community of women who work in digital and choose to share their knowledge, power, and connections. You can learn more about our community at www.togetherindigital.com. As I was mentioning to our live listening audience earlier before we started recording, this is our last episode of 2022, so fear not, we will be back in the new year, but we are really excited to be ending the year with Kim Scott. Kim Scott is the author of Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying to Build a Kick-Ass Culture of Inclusivity, as well as one of my personal favorites, Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity, and the co-founder of Companies Just Work and Radical Candor. Kim was a CEO coach at Dropbox, Quadratics, Twitter, and other tech companies. She was a member of the faculty of Apple, to Apple University before she led AdSense, YouTube, DoubleClick, and Google, which our audience knows and loves very much because we use a lot of those every day. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, Kim managed a pediatric clinic, clinic in Kosovo and started a diamond cutting factory in Moscow. She now lives with her family in Silicon Valley. Thanks for joining us today, Kim. We're happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, excited to, for our conversation. Me too. So our listeners in our community are women that work in digital, as I mentioned before, marketing and advertising and tech. So I wanted to make sure when I was asking questions, wasn't making it all about me. I want to make sure I'm asking questions from their perspective. Um, so I just read your bio and bios aside, um, I'm, we talk a lot about career changes and career pivots, and I think it happens maybe in digital more than any other sector I've seen. Um, I wanted to know, how would you describe what you do now, how you came to it? And then I want to talk for a minute about this pediatric clinic in Kosovo and diamond cutting <laughs> factory in Moscow. <laughs> Yeah, as you can tell, I've made a lot of pivots. Uh, my, I would, I would say that what, what I am now is a writer. I, I spend, I try to spend. Actually, I rarely succeed in this, but I try to spend the majority of every day writing. And uh, I would, I, I would say that my whole business career was actually a plan to subsidize my novel writing habit. Uh, so. So the, when I graduated from college, I really wanted to, I had studied Russian literature and I really wanted to write, but I couldn't make a living writing. And so uh, that was sort of what led me to explore other things, try a bunch of other things. And, and I, I sort of learned along the way that management actually can scratch a similar itch that writing can, because for me, Writing is about sort of understanding what is the environment that will unleash human potential that will and that will create the right conditions for our shared humanity instead of instead of repressing it and uh, and you know living in Moscow I got a lot and this it was the Soviet Union when I moved there it was 1990 I, I got uh, uh, I learned a lot about the conditions that uh, are not so good for humanity. Sorry, I can't hear you all of a sudden. I think you're on mute, Amy. <laughs> I was. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so fascinating. And I think um, any opportunity you can have to live or be abroad, it does really change your perspective. And I'm kind yeah. of curious as to like, you know, looking back, did any of that time or any things that you noticed there sort of change the way that you look at leadership and management? Absolutely. I mean, when I, so why did I move to Moscow when I graduated from college? I mean, partly because I, I studied, uh, I studied Russian literature, but the reason why I studied Russian literature actually is that when I was in high school, the Air Force did a reach out to the citizens of Memphis, Tennessee trip, and they uh. flew us out to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and where a general sort of explained to us why it was important to have enough nuclear weapons to blow the world up four times <laughs> over once was not oh. enough and i remember thinking Golly. surely that's not right you know right? and and but you know i was 17 I, uh he was a general you know yeah. what did i know yeah. but i really wanted to understand and study it and and that was sort of what led me down a particular path mm -hmm. and um 
I always kind of looked down on business as mm. uninteresting. Uh, yeah. You know, it was filthy lucre. And then <laughs> I, I wound up, uh, I wound up having to start this diamond cutting factory. There's a whole long story there. But anyway, so my job was to hire these diamond, these Russian diamond cutters. Uh -huh. And I thought it would be easy. I was like, I have dollars, the ruble is tanking, you know, that's right. what management is. It's just paying people. What's so hard about that? It's not <laughs> profoundly uninteresting. So I went to talk to these guys and, and they were all guys. Mm -hmm. And it turned out, they they weren't going to just take the job to my surprise they wanted a picnic well okay i could also do a picnic that wasn't so hard so i i organized a picnic right. on the outskirts of moscow and when we finished a bottle of vodka it became uh -huh. clear to me that what 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 i had to offer that their state enterprise did not have to offer was that I could give a damn. They would mm -hmm. know if they came to work uh, for 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 me and the company that I was working for, that they would have a boss who cared enough about them to get them and their families out of the country if yeah. things went sideways there. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, after the invasion of Ukraine, I've been thinking a lot about oh, yeah. these people. Sure. Um, and uh, and so it was that moment that I realized, oh, management is actually interesting. It's about yeah. sort of caring about people and creating the conditions uh, for them to do the best work of their lives and and also enjoy working together. It's almost like uh, management as Mrs. Dalloway organizing a yeah. party. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah. That leads yeah. nicely into our next question because we want to talk for a moment about radical candor for anyone who's not familiar yet with it. Um, because part of it is care, right? That's half of it. Yes. Um, can you describe for listeners who are new to this term what is radical candor? And I'm actually gonna hold my second question up for um just a moment and just answer that first for okay. me. So radical candor is what happens when you care personally and challenge directly at the same time. It's love and truth at the same time. You don't have to choose between those two things. Yeah. And I think, I think it's also interesting to think about what radical candor is not. Uh, so if you think, uh, because sometimes people, you know, I'll be working with the team and someone will charge into a conference room and they'll say, in the spirit of radical candor, and then they will proceed to act like a garden variety jerk. And that is not yep. the spirit of radical candor. That is the spirit of obnoxious aggression. So if you think about radical candor in terms of a two by two, you know, all of life's hardest problems can be boiled down to a good two by two. Yeah, yes. On the, on the vertical, <laughs> on the vertical axis is is care personally on the horizontal axis is challenge directly and obnoxious aggression is what happens when you challenge directly but you forget to show that you care personally maybe yes. you do care but you don't show it mm -hmm. and obnoxious aggression is obviously problematic because it hurts other people yeah but it's problematic for another couple of reasons as well it's also problematic because you're wasting your breath it's a waste of it's a waste of energy because when you are obnoxiously aggressive the other person goes into sort of fight or flight response. Absolutely. And then they literally physically cannot hear what you're saying. So you're yep. wasting your breath. And then there's a third problem with obnoxious aggression, which is which at least happens to me. Because I don't know about you all, but I find when I realize I've acted like a jerk, mm -hmm. it's not my instinct to go the right way on care personally. Instead, I go the wrong way on challenge directly. And then uh -huh. I wind up in the worst place of all, manipulative insincerity, where I'm neither caring nor challenging. Yeah. And so if obnoxious aggression is front stabbing, manipulative insincerity is backstabbing. And both of those things are bad, right? right. In different ways. Um, but the, the, the problem here is that this is where the drama is. So when we talk about what goes wrong at work, we tend to talk about incidents of obnoxious aggression or manipulative insincerity. But in my experience, the vast majority of us make the vast majority of our mistakes in yeah. this last quadrant where we do remember to show that we care personally, but we're so worried about not hurting someone's feelings that we fail to tell them something they'd be better off knowing in the long run. And that is what I call ruinous empathy, where you are caring, but you're failing to challenge. 
That's so there, that's the TLDR, but please do read Radical <laughs> Right? Yes, because the way that you roll things out in the book, I think that's one of the things I love about your work is that um, a couple of things. One, you give language. So having those descriptors and those words that really help you see and recognize it helps you call it out, notice it within yourself and maybe with others if they're familiar. And then, yeah, who doesn't love a good infographic of some sort? So there's her books are full of diagrams and illustrations to help you really visually see how and why something is, you know, happening or how you can shift and move and make changes, which again, like understanding how people learn and are motivated differently. I just think your books and the approach to the work that you do, it's just very inclusive in that respect. So I love it about that. I love that. And, um, Thank you. yeah. And I wanted to note for just a moment too the, um, I had heard this once and this has helped me take a step back whenever, um, someone is being obnoxiously aggressive or there's being a confrontation, um, is to tech is to step back and to actually slow down and step away because apparently our, um, our IQ drops by like 20 points when we are feel threatened. Like when we go yeah. into fight or flight, our IQ actually drops. So you're like better off just not engaging right then. Um, because what you have to say is likely not going to be something that in it is intelligent. Now yeah. it's, it's really hard to respond. I agree with what you said. It's really hard to respond to obnoxious aggression. Another uh, another mantra in, when when you're in those moments where someone else is being obnoxiously aggressive and then you yourself are mad, you know, it's the instinct is to get yeah. mad back is to tell yourself, get curious, not furious. Yeah. I just, I just share the framework for folks if they want to take a quick look. I love it. Yes. Thanks for the visual. I love that. Get curious, not furious. I agree curiosity can be a very strong antidote to a lot of confrontation, which somebody who's an yes. Enneagram type nine, like me, I'm like, bring it more questions, more yeah. curiosity. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so on the note of radical candor, um, you know, again, highly encourage you all to check out the books if you haven't already. Um, I'm kind of curious, like as you're coaching and working with folks, do you find that it goes against social conditioning, especially as it pertains to maybe women and people of co color? And if so, in what ways? Yes, a hundred percent. I do. Uh, it, 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 I mean, I think it, <clears throat> I think it goes against social conditioning for all of us because when the, the fear of sort of social exclusion mm -hmm. is as great as the fear of death, like it's a real, right. it's a real, <laughs> it's a yeah. real thing. Uh, and so I think that for a lot of us, for, for almost all of us, actually, it is our instinct not to be radically candid. It's our instinct mm -hmm. to hang out in ruinous empathy or manipulative insincerity. Mm -hmm. And so one of, and, and the problem with that is that that then gives people who are obnoxiously aggressive an advantage, an unfair advantage in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. because, because if you don't challenge that obnoxious aggression, if you don't confront bullying, for example, Right. then it works, you know, and, the, and, and then the bullies begin to win. And, and that's when your culture begins to lose. But let me talk. I would love to talk a little, a lot more, actually. Yeah. You're going to have to interrupt me no, uh, because this is, is actually the topic of my whole next book. Uh, oh, I, I shortly, uh, shortly after I shortly after I published Radical Candor, I was giving a talk at a tech company in mm -hmm. San Francisco and the CEO of that company is someone who I like and respect enormously. She had been a colleague of mine for the better part of a decade. Mm -hmm. And she's one of too few black women CEOs yeah. in, in tech or in any other sector. Yeah. And after I gave the presentation, she pulled me aside and she said, Kim, I'm excited to roll out radical candor on the team. I think it's gonna help me build the kind of culture I want. Mm -hmm. But I gotta tell you, Kim, she said, as soon as she would offer anyone even the most compassionate, gentle criticism, she would get slimed with the angry black woman stereotype. And I knew this was true. Yes. And and as and as soon as she said it, I, I had four revelations at the same time. Uh -huh. The first was that I had not been the kind of colleague that I imagined myself to be. I had not been an upstander for her. I had failed even to notice the extent to which yeah. She had to show up unfailingly cheerful and pleasant at every meeting we had ever been in together, even though she had what to be pissed off about, as we all do. 
Yeah. So, so that was number one. I'd been sort of in denial about the things that were happening mm -hmm. to my colleagues who are black, uh, and and I felt ashamed about that. Sure. The second thing, but I didn't want to, you know, I you, the only way out of shame is through. So I didn't want to yes. like be. I wanted to acknowledge it. This. The second thing that I realized in that moment was that I had also been in denial about the kinds of things that had happened to me as a white woman in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to think of myself as a victim. Right. And so I uh, and so I pretended that a whole host of things were not happening to me that were happening to me. Yeah. And I think we all know how that goes. And, uh, and, and that's kind of a hard thing for the author of a book called Radical Candor to admit that I've been <laughs> in denial, but I had been. Uh -huh. And then the third thing I realized was that even, uh, you know, as little as I wanted to think of myself as a victim, even less did I want to think of myself as the culprit. Right. And so I was most deeply in denial about the time, times that I had done things that harmed my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that was something I needed to, to come to grips with. And then the fourth thing I realized was that as a leader, I imagined I was creating these bullshit free zones in which everybody could love sure. their work and love each other. And I realized I hadn't. I had because if I was not sufficiently aware of bias, prejudice, and bullying, then I wasn't I wasn't challenging them. Mm -hmm. And so I that was what prompted me to write my next book, Just Work. So that's that's a partial answer. I have yeah. a lot more to say on this topic. No, definitely. No, that's fantastic. And it's, it's like, we're, we're in sync, Kim, because I, the, the next question I was asking is outside of social conditioning, there are social ramifications for women, specifically women of color as well. In yeah. leadership, there's a leadership double standard that often leads women to receive disproportionate levels of punishment or feedback when they act similarly to a man. A study yeah. by a corporate consultancy, Vital Smart, found that women who speak forcefully in the workplace, uh, their deserved compensation can drop by up to as much as $15,000. Wow. That was more than twice the cost that, um, than men who speak out angrily in the workplace. Not only does anger in the workplace cost women financially, but it also affects how people perceive their competency, leading many of us to into manipulative insincerity because it's like, I don't, you know, am I doing this for myself more than them? Um, when coworkers observe a woman being angry or as angry as a man, that women perceived uh, their competency was perceived as like it dropped by like 35%. So significantly yeah. more again than their male counterparts. So I thought that was a really interesting observation and study. I'm sure everyone who's listening has felt this. I know I had been called aggressive once in a review and I asked my boss at the time, I was like, have you ever used that word in a review with a man? He's like, oh, you know, we've got all this stuff in the database. I can go back and look. I was like, you look. And he came back and he was like, yeah, no, I've, ne I've never had that written <laughs> or repeated to. It's like, interesting, because I'm sure you use different language. Anyhow. Yeah, yeah Amy. <clears throat> Sorry, interrupted you. Yeah, I had the same. I remember I had an interview and the feedback I got it is like, I am very, um, I speak loudly. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm, I know. Yeah. I try to control, but when I get excited, my voice yeah. gets doubled. Uh -huh. uh, some of the questions I get excited and uh, my voice raise and mm -hmm. uh, some of the male leaders, they didn't like it. Right. And some of the question I just blunt out, uh, <laughs> they didn't like it. And then the feedback I got it. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, I know some men who speak louder than me, right. how they get a response to that. And when I talked to a couple of people, they said, you are color and a woman. Probably they did not like the way you speak. And right. uh, I you know, I was so depressed for a couple of months and thinking how I can adjust myself. Mm. But then I thought, why I need to adjust? Because uh, some people don't like me the way I speak. Right. Um, the, uh, so I can totally relate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate you opening up and sharing with us because yeah, even in our live listener chat, we've got a couple other comments. Like somebody was told they shouldn't get so frustrated when things go wrong. You know, we are emotional. It is. So do you have any thoughts kind of all of these things considered, you know, 
when women especially are trying to implore radical candor, what are some of the finer points and details or even some of the work that you've done from just work? Um, how can we begin to navigate some of this feedback even? Yeah, I think very often bias, prejudice and bullying masquerade as feedback. And those are not that's that that, that is not feedback. It's bias, prejudice and bullying. And you, and you should feel free yeah. to reject it. Uh, yeah. And so, but but I think uh, let's let's start by talking about kind of this abrasive. If you, I'll I'll send you when we're done a, a link to this great article written by Kieran Snyder about the abrasive problem, and mm. she did a textual analysis of performance reviews, mm -hmm. and and women, uh, all women, are far more likely to be called abrasive. Yeah. Uh, in their performance reviews than men are. And, uh, and if you're a woman of color, you're, you're that much more likely at, at, at any intersection, mm -hmm. uh, you're much more likely to be, uh, to be called abrasive and to be punished. But the men exhibiting the same behaviors uh, will be, you know, will say, yeah, he's assertive, but he has to be to get the job done. Yes, that's yep. it, the abrasive trap. Thank uh, you. I, I was at a, I was at a, I was, uh, coaching a CEO at our company when that article came out. And you cannot imagine how, you know, there was a thread, somebody sent it out to a MISC email alias, uh -huh. and there were hundreds of stories poured in. I mean, it, it was like this cathartic moment for all the <laughs> women at this yep. company. So what do you do when you, if you are unjustly accused of obnoxious aggression, you're being radically candid, but because of bias, you're unjustly accused of obnoxious aggression, only it's not gonna be called obnoxious aggression. They're gonna call you abrasive, bossy, bitchy, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how do you respond uh, in, in the moment? First of all, I think you know your story about questioning your boss, have you ever used that word with a man is perfect. Like take, uh, <laughs> you know, take a page out of Amy's book on that. <laughs> I think also if you want to sort of deal with it in the moment, mm -hmm. what I recommend is you, you take an extra beat. It is not fair. Let me just say it is not right. fair that you have to do this. It is not just that yeah. you have to do this. But if you take just an extra beat to sh say that you care, you know, I can tell this project is really important to you. I have a thought. I think it'll I think it'll make you more successful. Take that extra beat to show mm -hmm. that you care. Mm -hmm. That will often help. I, I was working with, I was working at a, at a company, I'd taken a new job and I was working very closely with, with one man. And after we had worked together for about a year, we were wrestling with something and I was, I was offering some radical candor and his eyes got big and he said, oh, you're doing this because you care. You just want to help. <laughs> And I was like, yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, uh, and so I wish I had helped him have that revelation a little mm -hmm. sooner. But right. you want to be careful as you're moving up on the care personally dimension as a woman, because you don't want to get sucked into doing all the emotional labor in this. Yes. You will burn out. Uh, yes. You don't want to get sucked into doing the office house housework. You don't want to get sucked into clearing the car. I mean, there have been times when I've been in a board meeting and there and there's coffee. Somebody brought coffee and it's right outside the board meeting. And I really wanted the coffee, but I had to sit on my hands not to get up and go get yep. it. I was going to wait until. Uh, so, so you want to make sure that you don't burn out. Virginia Woolf wrote a wonderful essay called The Angel in the House. And this essay was referring to a, a Victorian poem about a woman who had no wants or needs of her own, but she just existed to serve the men around her. Yeah. And Virginia Woolf said, the job of the woman writer is to kill the angel in the house. Like, don't do that. Don't, don't, that's getting sucked too high up. Right. On the care personally dimension. And I think, unfortunately, the angel sort of left the house and entered the office. I think we get asked to do similar things at yes. work. Uh, and yes. so don't let that happen to you. Right. But do take an extra beat to help people understand that you're saying this thing because you care. So that's one that's one dynamic. Now, the other dynamic that happens is is a kind of a form of ruinous empathy. So very often 
uh, and, and Shelley Carell has written about this, that women and especially underrepresented women, but, but underrepresented people along any dimension often do not get the kind of performance feedback that they need. And I want to pause for a moment about why I'm using the word underrepresented. Uh, so as a woman, I am part of an underrepresented majority, actually. There are slightly more women <laughs> in the world. Yeah. And as a white person, I am part of uh, an overrepresented minority. There mm -hmm. are, in California anyway, white people are not the majority. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the, the problem is not being in the minority or in the majority. The problem is when you're underrepresented, because when one group of people is consistently underrepresented, it means they've been consistently underrecognized, undervalued, so on and so forth. But that they've been discriminated against, basically, yeah. is why that happens. <laughs> and so what the, here's the kind of thing that happens in ruinous empathy. Uh, I was talking to uh, someone who led DEI at a big bank, and they said that they would they would see the following thing happen over and over and over again. Senior banker goes to a meeting with an analyst, and in week one, the analyst is a man. The analyst makes a mistake after the meeting. The senior banker tells that analyst, is very radically candid with that analyst, the analyst never makes the mistake again. In week two, same banker goes to a similar meeting. This time, the analyst is a woman. Woman makes the same mistake that the man made the week before, but this time the banker does not tell her. Not because he's a misogynist jerk hell bent on destroying her career, but because he's been taught since he was a kid to be gentler with women. Yeah. Maybe he's afraid of tears or something. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't say anything. And then she repeats the mistake and it hurts her career. Right. And so that's the kind of performance feedback that often people who are underrepresented are not getting. And uh, the president of Morehouse College wrote a great article called Protective Hesitation about how this happens around race. Uh, yeah. But I think it, it happens along, along any dimension of underrepresentation uh, that you can imagine. So if you are underrepresented mm -hmm. and you feel like you're not getting that feedback, you need to work a little. Again, it's not fair that you have to do this, but work right. a little bit harder to solicit the feedback from your boss. Make sure your boss is giving you feedback and then uh, i will i will sort of share a third thing that i have observed if you if you are underrepresented and you've been getting bad feedback bias prejudice or bullying instead of feedback but bias prejudice or bullying masquerading as feedback it is very tempting to just block out all feedback Right. Because so much of what you've been getting is is harmful, actually, <laughs> instead of helpful. And I think it's really important to begin to open yourself back up to the helpful feedback mm -hmm. and to learn how to solicit good feedback at the same time that you're rejecting the bias, prejudice and bullying. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. It went nicely right into my next question again. It's like so. But I want to call out just before I want to take a moment because I care for all of those of you that are listening, if you're being asked to do the holiday parties or the extra cleanup, you are so right. One of the best boundaries you can build for yourself is to acknowledge and know when you're being asked to go above and beyond in ways that are just emotional and or not typically asked of the others around you. You have an opportunity to delegate. You've got the opportunity to recommend others and you have the opportunity to say no. So I just want to remind you all because I know so many women, we just did a member survey. So many women are experiencing burnout right now. And so much of it really does come from, I think those two things of that emotional labor and those unspoken yeah. expectations of what we do at home and at work without, you know, a fair amount of support or without feeling comfortable with asking for help or knowing yeah. even how to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, I want to, can I share a, please. Uh, it's a little depressing, but let's figure out what to do about it. So there's okay. a study, there was a study, uh, <clears throat> where they had a man was by the Xerox machine mm -hmm. and, and they, uh, and, um, somebody would come up to him and say, can you copy this for me? I'm late for a meeting. And mm -hmm. he would say, no, I don't have time either. And, and then the, the observers of this dynamic would say how they felt about him, about the man who refused to make the copies. 
And everybody's like, of course he didn't make the copies for this other person. But when it was a woman standing by the Xerox machine and somebody asked her to do it and she said, no, I don't have time. She was not a team player. So yeah. I want to I want to acknowledge something. And this is important. I think there's a reason why women take this work on. It's because they're penalized when they're not. It's not because yes. they're wimps who don't know how to stand 100%. up for themselves. Yes. Uh, and so I think learning how to how to refuse to do it without uh you know without being penalized for refusing to do it right. is the trick right absolutely it reminds me we had a, a podcast a couple episodes ago too julie if you don't mind dropping it in the link and we'll include it in the show notes as well um we talked about we talked with Kay um mclaughlin about uh human giver syndrome Yes. And it's very prevalent within caretakers and especially women, because, you know, it's just a lot of times in the in our society, how we are brought up and raised. So I want to, I want to bring it back to feedback for a minute, because okay. uh, that was one of my questions as well. We all kind of have a love hate relationship with it, but what are some ways that you've enlisted, um, some, you know, requests for feedback that are more honest versus placating, because like you yes. just said, the whole point you just made, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the perfect for this next question. Cause yeah, we do get some placating <laughs> feedback from time to time because we all want to please yeah, or yeah. because of biased reasons. So what are some ways to kind of push through that? So I think that if you, if you want to ask for feedback, you need to keep four things in mind. The first is you want to think about the question you're going to use. Because if you say, do you have any feedback for me? You're wasting your breath. I can already uh -huh. tell you the answer. Oh no, everything's fine. Nobody, except your teenage children, if you have those, <laughs> wants to give you feedback. The teenage right. children, they really want to do it. But those are yeah. the only people who are actually eager to give you feedback. And by the way, even with the teenage kids, it's good to, it's good to be open to the feedback. Yeah. But, but most people are going to say, oh, no, everything's fine. So how are you going to ask for the, how are you going to ask? The question that I like to use is what could I do or stop doing that would make it easier to work with me? But don't use my question. You got to use your question. Because if you all right. sound like Kim Scott, people won't believe you really want to. You got to sound like yourself, not like yeah. me. And so what are the elements of a good question? The first is... You want to ask a question that demands an answer. You don't want to ask. In fact, if you read the book, you'll notice that I phrased it slightly differently. I said, is there anything I could do or stop doing? And so if you write a book about feedback, you're going to get a lot of it. And somebody yep. explained to me that that was not the best way to ask the question. The best way to ask the question is, what could I do? Because is there anything so that gives someone uh -huh. the opportunity to say, no, everything's fine. Yeah. So what's the question that you can ask that'll really put someone on the spot? Your, and it, the question has to be authentic to you, but you also need to adjust your question depending on who you're speaking with. So, for example, I was working with Krista Quarles when she was CEO of OpenTable, mm -hmm. and Krista said, you know, Kim, your question is fine, but I could never imagine those words coming out of my mouth. She said, the way I like to ask is, tell me why I'm wrong. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Right? But it was a very, you know, it was a sort of a very assertive way, which is good to be assertive. But uh -huh. some people who she worked with felt like they, they, they felt attacked. When she, so she had to back off a little bit for those people. So, mm -hmm. so you want to make sure that being that you remember that being authentic to yourself doesn't mean ignoring the impact that you're having on others. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you got to adjust it. So that's your question. So, so if everybody actually can right now pull out a pen and write down their question and who they're going to ask it of and when they're going to ask it, our time today will be really well spent. Right. So that's your question. Now, the bad news about your question is that no matter how good it is, the other person is still going to feel uncomfortable. Sure. Again, the only way out is through. So close your mouth and count to six. Also great advice. <laughs> I only made it to three, right? And and uh, it's felt like a really long time. So so if you can manage to stay silent for six full seconds, and and this is like one one thousand, two one, th you got to really be patient. The person is probably going to tell you something. Yeah. Now the third thing to keep in mind is that you've got to listen with the intent to understand, not to respond. Because even though you just solicited feedback, when you get it you're likely to feel a little bit defensive. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're a lesser mortal or shut down the feedback. 
What it means is that you're human and that's okay. You're allowed to be human and that it stings a little bit when you get some feedback. So you want to make sure that you're prepared to ask a follow-up question or to state back what you think you heard to check yes. your understanding, not yes. to be sarcastic. So for example, my daughter recently gave me some, some unsolicited feedback <laughs> and she said, mom, I wish you weren't the radical candor lady. And immediately this like wave of parental guilt washed over me. I thought I'm spending too much time at work. Uh, you know, she wants more time with me. I, I jumped to a lot of conclusions. And yeah. then I thought, well, I should ask her what she meant instead of mm -hmm. assuming, you know, I should listen with the intent to understand. So I said, who do you wish I were? And she said, I wish you were the lady who minded her own business. So, <laughs> so <laughs> she, I could spend a little more time at work as far right? as she was concerned. Yeah, so you well, want to make sure you really understand yeah. what this person is trying to tell you and not jump to conclusions. Agreed. And then the fourth, the fourth thing you need to do is you need to reward the candor because mm -hmm. people take a risk when they give you radical candor. Mm -hmm. And if you don't reward that risk richly, then they'll never take it again. As we talked about before, like when these with these interpersonal social things, we are very, very afraid to take risks as as human beings for, yeah. for a good reason. For most of our evolution, if we were excluded from our community, we were dead. Yeah. And so so we're very risk averse. And, and if you don't reward that risk, mm -hmm. then you're never going to get any more feedback. So you've got to make sure if you agree with the feedback, you also fix the problem. You point out that you fixed the problem. You ask if you overcorrected, did I undercorrect? Usually when you get feedback, you need to try, you need to aim to overcorrect and then you'll get it about right. But there's also going to be times when you disagree with the feedback that you get. And in these times, the important thing is is that you first of all look for some there's some nugget of what they said there's some area of overlap between what they said and yeah. what you can agree with and you want to give voice to that uh, just to show that you're listening and that you're not knee jerk shut down the feedback and then you want to come back and say look as for the rest of it i want i want to i don't agree and i want to explain why mm. and as long as you are offering someone a respectful explanation of why you disagree, sure. that is actually a reward. I think we, we have this instinct that disagreement is going to pose a risk to our relationships. But the thing that destroys relationships is unspoken disagreement that piles up and piles up and eventually <laughs> kind of goes yeah. critical, right? And, blow, and, and, and blows up all over your relationship. So you want to make sure that you're offering a respectful explanation of why you, why you disagree. And, you know, at a certain point, you need to listen, challenge, commit, and you need to just go. You can't argue endlessly. But it is really helpful for a relationship to explain when you disagree, if you disagree. That is fantastic. I love that. That's so cool. Thank you so much. That's a fantastic framework. I hope all of you are taking notes. If not, good news. This is going to be a podcast in another week or two. So <laughs> yes, you'll be able to go back to it. And, and, you know, it works at home, actually. Is what I was going, thinking that. If you're going to be with your family yeah. over the holidays, this is very helpful stuff. A hundred percent. Yeah. You could do a whole other book just on that, right? The radical candor and like working through with families, um, especially yeah. around the holidays, especially around the holidays, especially, especially around the holidays. And even more so, especially in this, in this political environment where we're very yes. often, you may have some disagreements. In fact, I was just doing a, uh, uh, I was just doing a talk, uh, with this group galvanize and mm -hmm. it's a really interesting group that brings women together from all over the country to 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 have conversations about political issues to, to build a more inclusive a more in inclusive uh uh sort of political environment yeah. i mean it's it's a democratic leaning group but it's sure. sort of helping right. us I, I had to give a radical candor talk the day after the morning after trump was won the election. Mm. And I said, I'm going to change the subtitle of the book, be a kick-ass citizen without losing your humanity. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to encourage folks to, uh, you, you don't have to remain silent and fume uh, in, in the case, in these cases. You can have, you can find uh, 
your shared humanity humanity and sometimes when you're when you're having a disagreement with someone especially if it's about an an, an issue where there's a lot of emotion right which there often is around the holidays and around politics and you put yeah. the holidays and family and politics together and sometimes <laughs> you get an explosive mix nothing. but i think that i think that if if you if you can think about when you want to have a disagreement with someone mm -hmm. Your goal is not to force that other person to change their mind. Right. Your goal is to sharpen your own thinking. Mm -hmm. That then, even if you come away and you still disagree, it doesn't feel like it was a waste of time because now you've you've learned something about your own thinking and you've and you've sharpened it, and that can be a, a useful a useful way to go into those conversations. So you don't have to feel like you pretend to disagree when you. I mean, you pretend to agree when you actually disagree. Oh. That that's bad for a relationship. Yeah, it's almost ruined sympathy there, right? In a way. Yeah. yeah and or, or it's manipulative and sincere. Manipulative, yeah, because you're yeah. like, I don't want them to hate me. They're yeah, like, yeah, I, do, I don't love each care other. enough. Yeah, I don't care enough about you to tell you what I really think. And right. uh, yeah, so that's 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 at least for me. The, yeah. And I'm guilty of that. I'm this is a mistake we all make. It's not right. like I'm always radically candid for sure. Sure. Yeah. It's a hard habit to break because again, like for all the reasons, um, yeah. I do, I love it. It kind of reminded me of your earlier advice too, to get curious, not furious. I yes. found that when yeah. I meet somebody that I disagree with is I just get really, really curious and begin to ask them questions, which actually makes them question what they're saying a little bit deeper as well. Yeah. And it doesn't come off as quite as confrontational or maybe aggressive. So yeah. Fantastic. I love how throughout our conversation and throughout your books, you always include a lot of um, personal stories of um, not just like the victories and the wins, but also the times in which maybe you've had shortcomings or failed. So where do you find your courage to be vulnerable and how has it served you well? You know, I think I owe this to my grandmother. When I was mm. about six years old, I forgot what I did wrong, but I had done something. I think I had told a lie. And my grandmother really, she told, she was very radically candid uh, with me about why, what I had done wrong and why it was wrong. And I was crying and she sat me down and she said, Kim, look, if you can listen, if somebody tells you when you've done something wrong and you can listen to what they say and decide for yourself if you agree with them or if you disagree, but if you can be open to that, she said, it will help you be a better person for the rest of your life. And I remember sort of yes. sitting on my parents' toilet. I had all my big revelations sitting on my parents' <laughs> toilet for some reason and thinking about what Granny had said to me and thinking, you know, Granny is right about that. That seems really true. And so so I, uh, I'm very grateful to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. I love it. Yep. I think it shows too a lot of what we have to teach our next generation by modeling and using these, you know, tactics and behaviors to sort of model the behavior. Cause well, we not we might not be perfect at it all the time. You're just helping to teach them to internalize and and leverage it to cope. And then at some point it turns around and comes back to you, you know, in yeah, so many yeah. ways as well. That's really awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, I think it's really important for our kids to know that we fail. Uh, and for our employees, to, for everyone around us, like yeah. to, to uh, you want you want my big radical candor fail story. Yeah, yeah, bring it. Speaking <laughs> of which, so this happened. This is one of the more painful moments in my whole career. I had just hired this guy, and we'll call him Bob. And I really liked Bob a lot. He was smart. He was charming. He was funny. He would do stuff like we were having a manager offsite. We were playing one of those endless get to know you games. And Bob was the guy who had the courage to raise his hand and to say, look, I can tell everyone is really stressed out and wants to get back to work. I've got an idea. It'll help us get to know each other and it'll be really fast. Whatever his idea was, we were done with it if it was fast. And he says, let's just go around the table and confess what candy our parents use when potty training us. Really weird, but really fast. Okay. <laughs> and then for the next 10 months, uh, weirder yet, we all remembered. Of and course. For the next 10 months, every time there was a tense moment in the meeting, Bob would whip out just the right piece of candy for the right person <laughs> at the right moment. So Bob brought a little Amazing. levity to the office. Yeah. Everybody loved Bob. 
one problem with Bob. He was doing terrible work. I was so puzzled. I couldn't understand. He had this great resume. I learned much later the problem was that Bob was smoking pot in the bathroom three times a day, which maybe explained all that candy, but I didn't know any of that <laughs> at the time. I just, I was just puzzled. Right. And Bob would hand stuff into me, shame in his eyes. He knew it wasn't good enough. Right. And I would say something to him along the lines of, oh, Bob, this is a great start. You're so awesome. You're so smart. Everybody loves working with you. Maybe you can make it just a little bit better, which of course he never did. Right. And this goes on for 10 months and the team around him is getting increasingly frustrated. Their deliverables are late because his deliverables are late. They can't do their best work because they're having to spend so much time redoing his work. And eventually the inevitable happened. And I realized if I don't fire Bob, I'm gonna lose all my best performers because they're frustrated. They just want to do great work and they can't in, right. in, this, in these conditions. And so I sat down with Bob to, to share a story, to, I mean, to share some feedback that I should have shared 10 months previously. Right. And when I finished explaining to him where things stood, he kind of pushed his chair back from the table. He looked me right in the eye and he said, why didn't you tell me? Oh. And as that question was going around in my head with no good answer, he looked at me again and he said, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all cared about me. Oh. And now I realized that by not telling him, I right. thought I was just being nice, but mm -hmm. it wasn't so nice after all. I'm firing him because of it. And, and so let's think about what was going on with me, why I wasn't telling him. Part of it was truly ruinous empathy. I really did like Bob and I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the ruinous empathy part. But if I'm honest with myself, there was something more insidious going on as well, because I, he was popular. Bob was popular and Bob was also kind of sensitive. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid if I told Bob in no uncertain terms, that his work wasn't nearly good enough, he would get upset. He might even start to cry. And then everybody would call me a you know what. Yeah. And and so the part of me that was worried about my reputation as a leader, that was the manipulative insincerity part. And the part of me that was worried about Bob's feelings, that was the ruinous empathy part. And it was terrible. It was a terrible moment. It was bad for me. It was much worse for Bob, of course. It was bad for the whole team and it was bad for our investors. We weren't able to get stuff done because I had been reluctant to, to be radically candid with Bob. Yeah, such a great example. Yeah, I remember reading that one in your book. I think I might've actually come to that question <laughs> about yeah. vulnerability when I remember when I re when I reread that um, because it is a hard thing as a leader to say, to go back and be like, I was, I was wrong. I didn't do what I was supposed to have done. And somebody has yeah. paid a pretty heavy price for it. But as you said in the book, Bob landed on his feet. He's okay. Everything's yeah, fine. Bob's, Bob's the, Bob, got his, Bob got his pot habit under control and uh, he got a great job, actually. It's all so, good from there. Yes. All right. We got a few more minutes left and I want to leave a few minutes for our audience to ask questions if they would like. Um, but I do want to, I want to throw in one of the questions we did get. Um, I asked our uh, Slack community beforehand if they had any specific questions for you as well. And one of them was, what are some ways we could implore radical candor to help interrupt mansplaining or other biased behaviors while it's happening? Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I want to think about bias, prejudice, and bullying, because I think one of the things that makes it so hard to confront these things with radical candor is that we confuse them. Mm -hmm. And these are actually three very different things. They're not the same thing. So bias, I'm going to offer some super short definitions. Bias, let's call it not meaning it. That's my definition, not meaning it. The person doesn't actually believe the implications of what they just said. Yeah, it's unconscious. Right. Whereas prejudice is a consciously held belief. The, the person does mean it, right? So yeah. not meaning it, meaning it. And bullying, I want to define just as being mean. The person doesn't have any belief, conscious or unconscious, they're just being a jerk. Mm -hmm. And so if you think, and you don't have to be sure which one of these three things is happening, but if you think it's probably bias, it's useful to respond with an I statement. I don't think you meant that the way it sounded, or I don't think you're gonna take me seriously if you're calling me honey or whatever. Oh, wow. uh, it is, it is, it's a way of inviting the person in to understand the situation from your perspective. Whereas right. if it's prejudice, you need an it statement. Okay. So what, what's an example of this? I, 
an if statement can appeal to the law, it can appeal to an HR policy, or it can appeal to common sense. So it is illegal, it is an HR violation, or it is ridiculous. An example of this is I was chit-chatting with a guy before a meeting, and he, I had just had twins, and he said, oh, my wife doesn't work because it's better for the children. And I didn't think he meant it quite the way it sounded. Sure. I didn't think he was trying to tell me I was a bad mother for showing up at work that morning. But so I made a joke and I said, oh, I decided to come to work because I prefer to neglect my children. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And I was, yeah, I was expecting him to laugh and apologize and we would move on. Sure. And, but no, he doubled down and he was like, oh, no, Kim, oh, it really, so. you should not be, you know. And so now I realized that was like, not We're in prejudice life. mode. <laughs> we're in prejudice mode. And so I said to him, it is an HR violation for you to tell me I'm neglecting my children. Uh, right. to show up at work. And and that had the desired impact. He backed, he backed way off. But I I didn't want uh the the problem here was that there were, you know, all these things are subtle and mm. I needed to have a relationship with this guy. And so having like shown him where the boundary was, he can believe right. whatever he wanted, but he couldn't yep. impose those beliefs on me. And and That's luckily nice. at that company there was an HR policy in place. Uh I said, look, I'm not going to make a thing of this with HR, but I, but I, let's just agree that it is my decision together with my partner, how we raise our children, just as it is your decision yep. together with your partner, how you raise your children. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, I, and, and furthermore, I said, I'm guessing you don't want to read the studies that I have that show it's better for the kids if the... <laughs> All <laughs> right. And, and I don't want to read your studies. Like, let's just agree. Yep. And, 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 you know, he understood that and we were able to move on. So, so you want to make sure that you're responding to prejudice differently. And I think it's tempting sometimes not to, if you think it's, if you, if you're not sure whether it's bias or prejudice, it's very tempting to just ignore it. Because right. if it is prejudice, you don't really want to know because it's prejudice is so much more enraging That's than right. bias. Yeah. Says. But it's useful to know, actually. Right. Uh, so, 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 so that is, and then if it's bullying, mm -hmm. you want a you statement. You can't talk to me like that. Or what's going on for gotcha. you here? My daughter actually taught me this. She was getting bullied. Uh -huh. in third grade and I was encouraging her to use an I statement I feel sad when you blah 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 sure. she banged her fist on the table and she said mom they are trying to make me feel sad why would I tell them they succeeded and I'm like right that yeah. is a really good point. That Brilliant. Is a really good point the I statement does not work with wow. bullying you need to you know you need to push the person away not invite them in and yeah um, makes sense so that's i mean there's tons more to be said about it please buy the book just work actually i'm editing i'm re-editing it for the paperback so oh fantastic um, yeah, good to know yeah. good to know we'll be on the lookout that's yes. i love it again such good framework and language so that you kind of in the moment when you're feeling fraught you have something that you could just take a moment and kind of go back to. We did have a question come in from one of our listeners too. She says, how do you handle a direct report that has an ego and thinks that they're, they are better than all of the other team members, but their work product doesn't reflect that they are kind of like a Bob, but maybe not so humble. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there may be a bullying Bob. I think yeah. that, that it is, uh, it is really important to remember that your job as a leader is to create consequences for bullying. And so if you let this person, if you let this person's arrogance translate to the team, then, then it, you know, the, the team suffers, the collective efforts of the team suffer. Exactly. And so thinking about sort of conversational consequences. There's, I think one, one subtle form of bullying is what I call the bloviating bullshitter. And this is the person, invariably the overrepresented person on your team who charges in, doesn't know anything, but takes up all the airtime. And yep. it is your job as a leader to shut that person down because it hurts. There's so much research that shows that the teams where everyone talks approximately the same amount mm -hmm. outperform the teams where one person dominates even if the person dominating is very competent is is some kind of superstar sure. but especially if the person is just mediocre and dominating 
And so you want to make sure that you shut that down. And then you also want to create consequences for that person. Very often, uh, a, a person who's bullying will not stop until they encounter consequences. And so you want to make sure that not only are you giving them that in the moment radical candor, but but you want to make sure that it is reflected in their in their in their compensation uh, mm. and in their performance review and in their rating. And eventually there need to be career consequences. If you've given this person a lot of feedback and they're still behaving arrogantly towards their teammates, then it is it is appropriate to fire that person. Uh, and you certainly don't want to promote that person. Right. Because there become there comes a moment, I think, on every team where the assholes begin to win. Yeah. And that is the moment when the culture begins to lose. And the and the That's camaraderie, the, the ability the team's ability to collaborate loses. Yeah. That's a great point. It's not just hurting you. It's not just hurting them. It's hurting the whole team. And I yeah. agree with you. If, if ever, if there were consequences for all the bullies in the world, oh, what a different yeah. world we'd be living yeah, in right we, now. Uh, yes. And, and if you're a manager, you can create those and do right. it. Do yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. It's tempting not to. I tell some very painful stories in Just Work about times when I failed to create those consequences yeah. and it had disastrous, disastrous results. Mm -hmm. for me and for everybody around me. Right. And that's the last thing we want as leaders. I hear that. All right. Does anybody else have any questions they want to come off of mute for or drop onto the chat? We've just got a couple minutes left. This has been great. So much. So awesome, Kim. Again, we've covered so much ground, but then obviously there's still so much more that we could dig into on a little bit deeper. All right. Live audience, you're being a little quiet today. You're all just- Be radically writing. candid about right. radical candor. <laughs> writing furious notes and hopefully ordering all the books. So I wanted to ask you one last question then. It's a kind of a fun question, Kim, because I feel like you get interviewed a lot for all the amazing work that you've done. Um, what is one question that you seldom get asked, but you wish that you were asked more often? And uh, what what's the, the, once you've told us the question, what's the answer? I think the question is, why do you want to be a novelist? <laughs> Which okay, no one yeah. really wants. People, it's very, it's it's really interesting. Sometimes when I introduce myself as a writer, people will say, well, you're not a writer, as though I'm like, I think there's nothing better than being a novelist. And the reason why I love to read novels and the reason huh. why I love to write novels is that I believe that's how we how we learn compassion and how we build empathy. Reading a novel is an opportunity for you to enter into someone else's shoes and to, to walk with them and, you know, enter into someone else's mind. And, uh, and it helps, it really helps us build our shared humanity. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Y'all are just coming in at the last minute. <laughs> We're at the consequences. hour. Yes. <laughs> consequences. Yes. Uh, consequences. Consequences. Deplatform. <laughs> Deplatform. Uh, and so, so you may, you know, and you don't have to be the CEO of Twitter in order to deplatform people. Very <laughs> right? often, what I mean is like, don't allow someone to dominate a conversation. Say, we've heard a lot from you, Joe. Uh, let's hear from other people people like th th another thing that someone taught me especially if you're presenting to a group like if you're a manager and one person is talking a lot walk towards them they will naturally get quieter oh, yes nice. don't walk away it's tempting if somebody's yelling to step away but if you walk towards them they naturally quiet down and then sometimes you can just literally body block them. Like you can turn around, turn your walk towards them, turn around, turn your back to them and say, I'd love to hear from some other people. That right. will, that, that is like, it's not a huge consequence, but it's pretty right. effective. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think that, that when you, ha if, even if it's not review time, if you give someone feedback around something mm -hmm. and you can tell they're kind of brushing you off, you can you can keep going further out on the challenge directly dimension. There was one person who I worked with who he was not a bully. It's important not to label people. Sure. I couldn't understand why he was behaving the way he was, but he but he clearly just didn't understand the impact that it was having on others. 
And he didn't understand the impact that it was going to have on his career. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of told him, but I hadn't told him forcefully enough. And I went into this conversation and I, and I said, I, I will, I, this is going to be a hard conversation. I had to, you know, Give he's until he's until he is as upset as he should be. I can't yeah. stop. You know, I, I need to keep going. Yeah. By the end of the conversation, he was in tears, mm -hmm. but he understood what he had done wrong and he right. fixed it and he, yep. and it made him much, we're still friends to this day. That's so good. it made That's him good. more successful. Right. Yeah. I've had, a, I've made a few people cry in the past and we're still friends too. I think that's an important balance there in etiquette. So thank you so much, Kim, for your time. This has been absolutely amazing. As I said, the feed's kind of blowing up with everybody saying how much they've enjoyed the conversation. Like I said, I highly encourage you all to check out the books. There's lots of these amazing frameworks that we've been referencing throughout the conversation in the last hour that you can check out, um, as well as check out Kim's website and whatnot. Kim, Thanks again. This was great. It was so fun having you with us. Thank you all. And if you want to give your team a gift, a holiday gift, give that we made a movie about Radical Candor. It's oh, great. The Feedback Loop. You can check it out and uh, and watch it with your team. We will you drop that link. The holidays. Awesome. That might answer your question too. Um, let's see, Candice, about how do you kind of implore it from day one is I think you just, you educate. It was like my boss. That's how I learned about Radical Candor. A boss handed me your book and said, read this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's sometimes so you the can, best way. So you can employ yeah, it. Yeah. Hand people the book or the feedback loop, or uh, I'm happy to come and talk to your team. Awesome. Well, All right. Thank you Thanks so, so much, much, everyone. We will see you in the new year. All right. Thanks take to care. everyone who helped make this podcast possible this year. I appreciate you, Julie. Thank you, Asiya. And thank you, Kim, for being such an awesome guest. Hope to see you all thank again you. in the new year. Happy bye -bye. new year to everybody. Thank you.